Good morning, Current Family. It's a super exciting Sunday, and we're so glad that you're able to be with us here this morning. We are celebrating baptisms today. We're going to hear two beautiful stories from current family members who are publicly declaring their faith. Such a tangible reminder that God doesn't stop changing lives during a pandemic. None of this surprises him as hard as it can be some days. We hope and pray that today is an encouragement and reminder to all of us that he is so present with us, that he's clearly working. We're still the church. We're still a community following Jesus together, and you're welcome wherever you are on your spiritual journey. If you've never experienced baptism before, it is a celebration and declaration of our decision to follow Jesus. Uh, in and of itself, baptism does not save us, but it's an outward expression of an inward spiritual reality of what happens when we commit our lives to Christ. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus and have never celebrated baptism, we would love to talk to you about this next step in your spiritual journey. Just fill out the connection card or send one of us an email and we'll be in touch this week. It's been super fun getting to know some of you for the first time via pub trivia or welcome lunch over the last couple of weeks. Uh, knowing that people, some of you are joining our groups virtually during shelter in place, a huge shout out and thank you to our current group leaders for your faithful ministry during this time. It's possible and all the more critical to find community during shelter in place for us to hold it out together as a church family. If this is your first time with us, an extra warm welcome to you. We would love an opportunity to be able to connect with you. Just fill out whatever information that you're comfortable with on the connection card and we'll be in touch. We'll go over to Chris and Ine for some worship music now and then David will be back to wrap up our series through the book of Esther. We'll see you soon. Good morning church. Let's worship together now. Sing together with me. We will remember we will remember, we will remember the works of your hands. And we will stop and give you praise, for great is thy faithfulness. All together now, one more time. We will remember, we will remember. We will remember the works of your hands And we will stop and give you praise For great is thy faithfulness You're our creator, our life sustainer, deliverer our comfort, our joy Throughout the ages You've been our shelter The peace in the midst of the storm With signs and wonders You've shown your power With precious blood You've shown us your grace You've been our helper, our liberator, the giver of life with no end. Here we go, we will remember. We will remember.
morning, everybody. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we can gather in this way. And thank you for the two baptisms that we're going to be celebrating. Would you please give us each your spirit now as we turn to your word? We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome again. I'm David. I recently discovered anew how important it is to make sure to stop, remember, and celebrate, even in the midst of hard times. In June, our kids had been going to school for about, you know, two, three months by that point on Zoom. And so when they graduated, one into third grade and one into first grade, it was kind of a wah, wah, you know, type experience for them. They were all saying bye on Zoom and they got to turn their materials into their teacher and say goodbye in person that way. But there was something lacking there. And so when our friends, neighbors, and, and uh, friends here at church in, in, invited us to our shared communal space down in our garage area, to celebrate their last day of school, their kid and our, our kids. We, we were like, yeah, that sounds great. So they brought some pizza out. It was an informal time. The kids were playing. But there was this time where we brought the kids together and we made sure to say, you know what, guys? We just want to stop and say, we are so proud of you. We're so thankful for all that God has been doing this last year in school. And we're excited to see what he's getting ready to do in this year ahead. And I remember watching our kids uh, uh, their, their eyes and seeing how much that meant to them. Even if they didn't quite realize it, how, how important it was to put this little marker down for them to stop and remember and celebrate what had happened the year before, even as they get ready to enter this new season, even in the midst of shelter in place. That is what I believe is here in this last portion of the book of Esther. As we conclude our, our series today in the book of Esther, we see how important it is for us to stop and remember and to celebrate God's goodness in our lives, especially when things are still hard. The book of Esther doesn't end with, and good wins the day, and the end. It actually ends with about three chapters of celebration. God's people just being so thankful throwing party after party, saying, God, you've been so good to us, so kind, which I think is important for us because it's easy, if we're not careful, to miss out on all the wonderful things happening in our lives and not celebrate them or remember them or reflect on God's goodness to us in the midst of, uh, of, of all of it happening, including in hard times. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Esther chapter 9. We're going to be focusing on, on chapters 8 through 10, but our reading will be from, from chapter 9. And as you're pulling that up, or if you don't have a Bible, that's fine. The, the words will be on your screen. Uh, let me bring us up to speed in terms of the events that have been happening in the book of Esther. Uh, what we see here is God, through Esther and Mordecai, has saved the day. The evil Haman had concocted this plan to get all of, of God's people, the Jews, killed. He had been promoted to second in command, and when he saw that Mordecai wasn't bowing down to him, undoubtedly because Mordecai knew he was an Agagite, they were the sworn enemies of the Jews and just detested Jews, so Mordecai just refused to bow down to him. Well, that just peeved Haman to the point of not just wanting to kill Mordecai, but all of Mordecai's people, all of the Jews. So Haman had a, a, the lot cast, the lot being called the, the purr back then, to determine a date for when this would be carried out. All of, all of the Jews would be killed. He went to King Xerxes, even throwing down modern-day equivalent of about hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars to, to, to bring this about. The king said, save your money. Go ahead and put it into law. He put his signet ring behind it. Well, this set up the events that we've been looking at over the last two weeks in chapters 4 and 7 in the book of Esther. Esther and Mordecai realized that God had probably brought them into their positions of influence for, quote, such a time as this. And so Esther, in particular, resolves to act to go to the king and petition on behalf of her people, even though it risked everything. Not just a life of luxury, not just her life being queen, but even her life. It was law back then that if you went into the king's presence and he, was, he didn't want to see you, you were killed. Anyway, she went in and she wasn't killed. The king instead actually said, well, what, what is your request, Queen Esther? Up to half the kingdom, it will be yours. She said, well, my request, first of all, is to throw a banquet for you and Haman. And then I'll put my petition before you there. Well, meanwhile, Haman was still up to his machinations, uh, trying his best to, at this point, just 
kill Mordecai uh, next chance he could. He put up, up uh, constructed a pole about 75 feet high in modern day terms that he wanted to impale Mordecai on. Little did he know he would soon actually be impaled on that same pole he had resurrected for Mordecai. The time came for Esther to throw this banquet for uh, the king and for Haman. And, and again, the king says, what, what is your request? Anything up to half the kingdom and it will be yours. And Esther pleads and says, you know, my request is just for my people and for my own life. An evil man has set to kill them all. And now the anger of the king was really starting to stir. And he says, who is this evil man? Not realizing that he had had a part in this. And she said, an enemy, an adversary, this vile Haman. And in that moment, Haman knew the noose was coming around his neck. And the king's fury just really raged. Uh, more, uh, Haman at this point even tried to grovel at Esther's feet, begging for his life, which just tipped the scales even further as the king was just upset with him and he was soon killed. Chapter 7 concludes with these words, then the king's fury was subsided. Well, that still left the edict in place, the edict that all the Jews would be killed on that date selected, preordained by the lot being cast. The law had said that anybody on that day could kill any Jew lawfully and take their goods. Well, this is where the brilliance of Mordecai and Esther really shined through because the law was that any, any law couldn't be revoked. So instead what they did, of, of being, instead of being able to revoke that law, they enacted a new edict saying, okay, on that same day, the Jews can lawfully organize, congregate, and defend themselves and kill any would-be attackers and plunder their goods, by the way, with the backing of the state. That's where we pick up now in chapter 9, verse 14. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa, that is the capital. The Jews in Susa came together on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa 300 men, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them. Again, remember, this is across 175 provinces. Killed 75,000 75, of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar. And on the 14th, they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. The Jews in Susa, however, uh, had assembled on the 13th and 14th, and then on the 15th, they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observe the 14th of the month of Adar as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. Mordecai recorded these events. He sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, son of Hamadetha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the pur, that is, the lot, for their ruin and destruction. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head and that he and his sons should be impaled on poles. Therefore, these days were called Purim for the word pur. Because of everything written in the letter and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and in every city. And these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants. And indeed, the Jews still today celebrate this festival of Purim. Here's what I want us to notice, a few things from this text. First, that we see here in these last few chapters of Esther a shift from the narrative following the events of a couple of individuals, namely Esther and Mordecai, to focusing on the people and the community, and seeing how they together were celebrating and remembering all of God's goodness to them. 
Now, when I say they were remembering God's goodness to them, you might be thinking, if you've been here, a part of our series up to this point, how can you say they're remembering God's goodness? God's never mentioned once in the book of Esther, including here. How do we know they're celebrating God, reflecting and remembering his goodness? Well, first of all, it's in the Bible, okay? But second of all, we see it here in the text. I mean, they named this festival Purim, named after the lot being cast, the Pur. In other words, they're remembering and celebrating God's providence, his sovereignty to work events, even of evil people, let alone of good people sacrificing, for the sake of bringing about good and justice and the deliverance of his people. And so over and over again, we see here in this text, uh, the, the statement saying, remember, verse 28, let not the memory of these days die out. Verse 22, celebrate, observe the day that you got relief from your enemies. It's important that we stop, reflect, remember, and celebrate God's goodness to us. But on the whole, it seems to me, we're not actually very good at this. And for a, for a few reasons. First, I think it's because we tend to be too busy to stop and remember and celebrate. We're just too busy. I mean, even in the midst of shelter in place, we got too many things happening and something good happens, well, we're on to the next. Some of you guys are in the midst of, you know, working up to, to, to make that big product launch and then you, that product gets launched and, you know, maybe you have a day where you're like, you're excited about it, but then the next project or the next deadlines are looming and so you're on to that. Or we're, 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 you know, in our own personal and family lives, you know, something amazing happens, but we're on to the next thing. It's, it's really easy to, to not stop and remember and celebrate God's goodness in our lives because we're too busy. But I think it, it's also easy to miss celebrating, remembering God's goodness in our lives because we tend to be too focused on us. We talked a little bit about this last week when we looked at some lessons on pride and humility in the book of Esther, talking about how it's really easy, without even knowing that we're doing so, to make life about us, that the world revolves around us. So maybe you do have that product launch or something something amazing happen in, in your life, your personal life, whatever it might be, and you do celebrate it, but when you do celebrate, it tends to be cheers to me and all that I've accomplished and what I was able to do. But even if you take God out of the equation, we gotta be really careful about having such a mindset. Why? Well, because so much, if not all of our accomplishments and successes are actually on the shoulders of other people's accomplishments and successes and work. I mean, so much of life is just dependent on others. And even just take, for instance, you know, our natural inclinations to, to do different things, our, our, our unique giftings, our passions, our personalities. I mean, different things that we can, we can maybe develop this way and that way, but really are just innate gifts that we've had all along that we're just using, stewarding. And then of course, for those who do follow God, I mean, how, how is it not easy to see, man, everything is just dependent on him. Any success or accomplishment is clearly a grace that he has just given us. James in his, in his letter to the early church said, for every good and perfect gift is from above, the father of lights. But if we're not careful, it's easy to miss the importance of stopping and remembering and celebrating God's goodness to us. How he weaves things together according to his sovereign plan for good. This text has really been speaking to me here in the midst of shelter in place. And with all that's happening in our country, that's, that's heavy. I mean, there's a lot to mourn right now. There's a lot to be upset about. But deep down, there's so much more that we can be thankful for, that we can stop and reflect and be and, and celebrate. Now, real quickly here, this is not to say we are not to mourn or not to be upset or fight for certain things, for the goodness in society. No, we absolutely are. But it's to say that we also need to remember to God's goodness in the midst of everything and celebrate him, including in the hard times. David, where are you seeing that in the text? Well, look back at chapter eight of Esther. I read from, from Esther chapter nine, that was the events recorded after the day of reckoning had taken place. But, but check out these words before the day, day of reckoning had happened yet. 
Uh, it says in, in Esther chapter 8, 15, and 16, I won't read it all, that there was great joyous celebration among the Jews. Happiness and joy, gladness and honor. Again, before that day of reckoning, before the day where they had to take up arms and defend themselves. I don't care if there was an edict passed saying you can defend yourself and plunder those who try to attack you. I don't care. You, you're still going to be nervous about that day, fearful of that day, worried, scared as so many things could go wrong. And yet, what do we see here? Even with that day looming, even in the midst of still hardship before them, the people of God were celebrating, finding ways to remember and see God's goodness in the midst of all of it. Christian celebration isn't only for when things are working out well. It's always. In Philippians 4, the apostle Paul said to the early church, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. At all times, we can celebrate and see God's goodness in the midst of things. We can celebrate, not just at the end, but all along the journey. If I'm real with you, and I imagine many of you will resonate with this, it, it, celebrating and remembering God's goodness in the midst of shelter in place has been a challenge. I mean, this is just stretched on for so much longer than I think most of us anticipated. And there's so much happening in the world that's heavy and sad. There's many of you who are on the front lines, risking your lives, risking the lives of your family as you help the betterment of society. You serve the rest of us. Uh, there are many people that we've lost to this disease. I mourn that children have, are having a bit of their childhood taken from them. Uh, I'm mourning Zoom. I love Zoom, but it's like it's also a reminder of what, what could be right now. I'm mourning the divisions in our country the inequality, the injustice, all the political divides, and on and on. I'm mourning the fact that it's hard as a church to meet in this way. Cindy and I mourn the fact that we can't just brush shoulders with everyone on Sunday mornings like we've grown accustomed to during normal times. I mean, it's amazing to me. I, I'm really no longer taking for granted how much happens, say, on a Sunday morning before church even starts, when we run into others as we're setting up and getting ready for, for the service, just asking and, and asking people, hey, how are you doing? And reading in their eyes how they're truly doing, knowing, with, knowing if we need to follow up or just spend a few moments hearing more about their week or what's going on in their lives or praying with them. I'm mourning the fact that right before we uh, shelter in place happened, we had just launched two services. And by God's grace, we were growing exponentially. And, and within something like six weeks, five people who had, uh, with, without any church background, decided to make first time faith decisions to follow Jesus. I'm mourning that, that that's been kind of, you know, stopped for a second, even as God continues to work. There's so many things that we can mourn right now that I'm mourning, but truthfully, I have to, I have to see, because it's, it's so right in front of me, if I, if, unless I just miss it, that God is still moving that there are wonderful things happening right now that are more than worthy to celebrate and remember his goodness in how, that he, that how, in how he is working right now. Because the reality is God is not surprised by COVID-19. It's not like shelter in place happened and he's like, oh, whoa, we gotta work with that. No, he's known. And so friends, we need to find a way to celebrate his goodness as he continues to work, which he is doing, and boy, I can just, I can't wait for the day when we can, God willing, meet again together in person. Everybody who's been a part of Current for any length of time knows that that's going to be a lovely day when we get together. How fun it is going to see everybody and celebrate. And yet, there's still much to celebrate and remember right now. For instance, today we are celebrating two baptisms. This last week or so, it just came out that, that three more people want to be baptized. And guys, I'm telling you, as you get to hear these stories of God working in their lives, some, some of whom have, haven't had any church background, but just different ways that God's been moving in their lives, it is just, it is fun to celebrate. There's nothing better than that kind of life change. We get to celebrate that today and the next few weeks and months ahead. If you're sitting there today and you'd like to be baptized, uh, it's, it's possible right now, even during the midst of COVID-19. Uh, let us know. We'd love to come alongside you in that. God is working in lives. Something we're celebrating right now are weddings. You might be surprised to hear that there's been weddings happening right now in current. 
uh, during COVID-19. I've actually already officiated three since shelter in place began, two in a park, one completely over Zoom, uh, all, all three amazing and wonderful times. And it's just a wonderful testament that these couples are just hey, s- saying, hey, we wanna, you know, yes, when things get back to normal, do a big celebration, wedding kind of celebration then, but here and now under the Lord with the complexities that, that COVID-19 and shelter in place are putting upon us, we, we wanna honor the Lord and make this decision here and now to get married and celebrate again later. So we're celebrating those. Uh, so much to celebrate. We're celebrating that the current groups are alive and fruitful as ever. Many of you are getting even more connected than ever before over Zoom. And we're grateful for that. We're grateful for Alpha. We re-kicked off Alpha uh, just a few weeks back. And I didn't think, I wasn't sure it was going to get going again. I mean, you just figure Zoom is not a great um the best of outlets or forms to, to be able to have conversations about the Christian faith and just explore things from, from a perspective of just people just asking whatever's on their minds. And yeah, it's been great. In fact, our Alpha group is getting ready to morph into an exploratory Bible study. So the group's really excited about that. We're celebrating God's goodness through the current teens ministry. Some of you know that we had just launched the current teens ministry right before Shelter in Place started. And I'm just looking back on that uh, time and just just thanking God for it because if we hadn't launched it then we'd be in tr- we, we'd be in trouble we wouldn't have a ministry for the teens I mean it's not like you can launch a teens ministry or at least it'd be incredibly hard in the midst of shelter in place and the leaders are telling us that uh, many of you teens who are a part of that are asking just wonderful questions some of you it's like you're reading you're learning to read the Bible for the first time man we are thrilled for you in that process we're very thankful for our wonderful leadership in that ministry. Uh, We're celebrating that we just got to do a pub trivia virtually with over 50 people in attendance. Uh, The leaders did an awesome job uh, pulling that off. But that's been a wonderful ministry that we've always had in order order to break down barriers for those, especially who's never been a part of current or any church, just kind of get to see and taste uh, and and what it feels like to be in Christian community with the hopes that they would see the attractive love of Christ in us. Many of those people who attended had never had, have no uh, church background, which was so fun. And if that's you and you're visiting today, we're so glad you could you could be here and be a part of our, our community. There's more we can highlight, but hopefully it's clear. God is moving. And there's so much to celebrate right now. There are so many things that we just need to pause and remember God's goodness to us in the midst of it all. And so, can you find some time this week, perhaps even later today, to just stop, pause, and remember, celebrate God's goodness in your life? Are you a journaler? You could could journal. Uh, You could go on a walk and just spend some time in prayer and reflection, just listing out the different ways God's been working in you or around you. Uh, for those of you who gather around a dinner table, you know, maybe with your family or roommates, whomever, you could just spend a few moments just listing off the ways that God has been good and provided, ways that you are celebrating. Now, I recognize that some of you may still be feeling, but David, what if there's just nothing I can find to celebrate right now? What if that's me? And you know, if that's you, friend, This text shows us that there's something here that we can celebrate no matter what that's better than anything else to celebrate in this life. Look again at verse 20, chapter 9. It says, Mordecai recorded these events and sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. Ultimately, that's the key phrase here. This is what the Jews were celebrating when it came down to it. Relief from their enemies. Actually, the Hebrew word there is rest. They were, they were experiencing rest from their enemies. They had been slaves in Egypt earlier on. They had been attacked along the wilderness route. They had been attacked as they came back to their land in Cana. Over and over again, God's people faced 
enemies and enemies. And the great promises all throughout scriptures that they would receive rest ultimately from their enemies, including Deuteronomy 12, it says, you will cross the Jordan, settle in the land, and the, and the Lord will give you rest from all your enemies. And then in Deuteronomy 25, it says, the Lord will give you rest from all your enemies around you. Here's the thing though. Esther gave them rest when she put the petition before the king and God, God worked his favor in the midst of that and delivered his people. Yes, there was rest for them. And God gave them rest through Joshua, say earlier in the Bible, uh, when, his, when the enemies attacked the people. And God gave, gave rest to the people through King David. Uh, during his reign. Uh, There are a number of places in the Bible throughout their history where God did give them rest, and yet it was never ultimate rest because enemies would always arise again. And the truth is that's how life works today. There's always enemies out there. If it's not a Haman, it's someone else. I mean, and I think if we search our hearts and we were just our experiences, we know this to be true. The world isn't the way it's supposed to be. There's conflict. People are criticizing others. They are attacking others. They're ignoring people. They are abusing people and on and on and on. People are at odds with one another. People are at odds with you and you are at odds and I am at odds with others, sadly, unfortunately. But this is the gospel in a way that Esther or Joshua or David or any of the biblical heroes of the scriptures could not do. Jesus, once and for all, defeated the great enemies giving us rest, the great enemies of sin and death. Sin really being all those things that we do in rebellion to God, ourselves making ourselves enemies towards him and just doing things that we want to do regardless of how God designed us and calls us to live. Things that hurt our relationship with him, hurt our relationship with others, hurt ourselves. And that's what's brought enmity into the world, right? I mean, sin like greed, selfishness, Pride. All these things create conflict and bring us into animosity with one another. And we're always facing that in little degrees or or greater degrees. Jesus died for the sin of the world to bring us into a relationship with God, to, to give us forgiveness of sins, to pay the penalty once and for all, that we don't have to worry about the effects of sin anymore, but we can live a life unto him. And he defeated death with his victory over the grave. Death really is the enemy of being separated from God. It's not just the the physical death, it's spiritual separation from him. Jesus, uh, through dying on the cross and rising again to life, and his victory over the grave, now brings us into an eternal relationship with God forever. And so now, there are no enemies. And even the vile Hamans of the world cannot touch you if you are in Christ. In fact, it is even to the point of Jesus' words that he said at one point, you have heard it said, love your neighbor. I tell you, love your enemies. We can love our enemies. Because if Jesus has has defeated the great enemies of sin and death, there's nothing, even our lesser enemies, whether it's our boss or coworker who's mistreating us, or, or, or heaven forbid, evil people like Haman, they can't ultimately harm our relationship with God, which is forever. And in fact, we can even seek to love them and extend them the grace that we ourselves need from God. That's the gospel, friends. That's the good news. And if you've never received this, you can receive it today. Receiving what Christ did for you on the cross when he died for your sins and mine, and that if you put your faith in him and what he's done for you, he brings you into a restored relationship with himself forever. And if you have put your faith in Jesus, it's here in this text throughout all the scriptures culminating in Jesus that there now is no enemy that can touch you, that can affect you. And so even in the midst of hardship, even in the midst of really trying times, there is always something to celebrate and remember that is greater than anything else we could celebrate or remember in this life. Greater even than the people of God were celebrating their deliverance in the book of Esther. Because while Esther saved her people for a time, Jesus saved all people who would call on his name forever. So friends, how can you celebrate and remember his goodness today? We don't have to just wait for Easter for that to happen. Today, even in the midst of the hardship of shelter in place, even in the midst of mourning and, and 
maybe being frustrated about things that are happening in our society, in our country. It's not to say to poo-poo those things or not to fight for justice and goodness in this world. And yet we can still, because of what Jesus has done, celebrate and remember his goodness in us and how he's going to work all things together for the good of those who love him. How can we join him in that and celebrate here and now his goodness along the way, always remembering? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the book of Esther and, and foremost how it points to you and your love for us. How Esther was able to save her people, just pointing ahead to the even greater story of how Jesus saved all people who would call on his name. Thank you so much for loving us that much that you would come into this world to die for us, to take care of the greatest enemies, sin and death on our behalf. We love you, Father. Would you help us remember and celebrate you, even in the midst of hard times, shelter in place or otherwise. Help us to remember and celebrate your goodness always. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's continue the celebration with uh, baptisms, but first I'm going to pass things over to Chris to lead us in worship through song. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb The desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could he? family. Hey, well, we have a really special day to celebrate. Uh, uh, baptisms, the first time since Shelter in Place started. Uh, we're obviously doing this with uh, social distancing in mind, but we, we're, we're excited to celebrate this with you. We're celebrating the, the baptisms with Susan and Flavi today. So let's really uh, cheer them on as they share their stories. And as they come out of the water, you can do that in the chat bar or whatever um, in spirit. Um, we're so glad you could join us for this. Uh, baptism is a sign and seal or an outward expression of something that's already taken place on the inside when we put our faith in Jesus. Uh, it signifies or gives us a picture of, of what it looks like when we, when we go under the water, and it's, it's signifying our, our death, 
uh, to sin, and then we come out of the water, uh, coming into a new birth or new life in Jesus Christ. So we're going to celebrate that today. We're going to have uh, Susan go first, and she's going to share a little bit of her story before we baptize her. Susan? Hi everyone, um, my name is Susan Jang and I am choosing to be baptized today to publicly proclaim my Christian faith. Um, Jesus is my savior and my redeemer and I'm ready to take the next step in my walk with God. Um, I grew up going to church and um, never really understood what it meant to be a Christian. Um, throughout my life I only went through the motions. Um, I believed in the Lord. I prayed and I went to church. Um, I struggled with a on and off relationship with God and um, I always wanted to go my own way with no thought of the Lord. Um, when I was 23, um, I lost my dad in a terrible car accident and um, I was so devastated and I couldn't believe um, that he was gone. But. You know, my mom was also in that same car accident and um, she came out of it unharmed and I truly believe that God saved her. Um, I still struggled um, just to keep my faith in Jesus. It was hard, um, but uh, I was reminded that life is a gift from God no matter the length that you're given. Um, so when five years ago, God placed my wonderful husband, Howard, into my life, and um, I felt a new hope for life. Um, I started to attend church regularly and began to have a real relationship with God. Um, I realized that all the blessings and all the difficulties that were placed in my life were a part of God's plan and that He always loves me and that He was always there for me and will always be there for me. Um, you know, Current has been my, our church family since 2018, and I'm so thankful um, that God has placed some amazing people in my life to encourage my spiritual journey. Um, shout out to my C3 group. Um, you know, I've um, carried a lot of pain and sadness with me the last 10 years, and I want to lay it all to him. Um, I'm ready to take um, for my new lease on life. Um, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the place, dwell in the land and enjoy safe pastures. Um, take the light in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37, 4, 3. Thank you. Susan Jong, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? Yes. Do you believe that God the Father raised him again to on the third day to that he would give you life as well? Yes. And do you commit to the best you can with his help to following him from this day forward? Yes. Susan Jong, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Woohoo! my story. I grew up as a, as a Christian kid. Um, my dad actually doesn't believe in God and my mom was a Muslim so I don't know what happened and they decided me to send me to a Christian school. So I went to a Christian school my whole, yeah, when I was a teenage. And then after that I went to a Bible study. But at that time I would call myself a Christian but I didn't really know what, uh, what, um, like how to live as a Christian. I was just living my life. And then so many things happened. I moved to the U.S. And then I was still living my life. I was like praying sometimes. Like I wasn't really a follower of God. And then something happened 
the death of Kobe Bryant and his daughter, it was a wake up call for me because at that time, I asked myself, okay, if I die today, where am I going to? And I, deep inside me, I knew that I wasn't going to heaven because I was living in sin. I wasn't um, following uh, God. I wasn't living a Christian life. And since that time, I decided to fully like pursue God with my whole heart. And then I started uh, reading uh, my Bible. The more I read my Bible, the more I realized that, yeah, I desperately need God. And I remember it was like a morning, two weeks before Easter, I was uh, reading uh, the book of Luke where Jesus went to pray on the mount. And he started, he was so, in, he was in pain. And then he was asking God to remove the pain. And then I, I don't know why, but I started crying. And then I realized that, wow, like it suffered so much for me, for my sin. And then for me to live in sin was like, a huge mistake I don't know like I started crying and then yeah and then I started reading my Bible I also read the book of Acts where the Ethiopian he was reading the word of God in he needed he needed some help he needed someone to to explain it like one verse and then Philip I guess Philip came and he was he, he explaining the gospel and then he saw the water and decided to get baptized that was like impressing. I was like, yeah, I want to do the same thing. But yeah, this, and the more I read my Bible, the more I realized that, yeah, I desperately need God and I can live my life uh, without Him. So today I decided to get baptized, yeah, to, yeah, to declare my faith, to show to people that I'm a newborn. I don't know. I don't know how can I say that in newborn. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting all over with Jesus. <laughs> We're okay? Okay. <laughs> You're very brave. All right, Flavi. Uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? Yes, I do. And do you believe that God the Father raised him again to life, that you will have life again with him because of what he's done? Yes, I do. And do you commit as best you can with his help to follow him? Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. 
Wow, so good. We love Baptism Sunday. Thank you, Flavi. Thank you, Susan, for sharing your beautiful story so boldly with us this morning. As mentioned, we are going to have another opportunity for baptism coming up in a couple of weeks. There are a few current family members that have already let us know they're ready to take this next step. Super exciting. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus and have never celebrated baptism, we would love a chance to be able to chat with you about it. Just fill out the connection card or send one of us, one of us an email and we'll be in touch this week. Let's continue our worship with the offering now. This is a time when we stop and remember all that God has done for us, worshiping him with our resources, indicating that we trust him and we trust his provision and that we want to join him in his life-changing work. You can give online at currentsv.church give or by texting a dollar amount to 84321. Your generous giving not only provides for our ministries here locally, it also allows us to unhesitatingly continually increase our partnership with organizations who are holding out the gospel and tangible help to communities of need, especially during a crisis like this. Next week, we, were, we are planning for an opportunity to hear a snapshot from one of our partners internationally in Greece, working with refugees there, what they're learning about their ministry during this crisis. Uh, and a little bit about our partnership with them. So make sure you join us next week to hear from HomeSpot. If there's something that you're remembering and praising God for this week, our prayer team would love to join you in that praise or to pray with you for anything that's on your mind, on your heart. You just press that live prayer button to the left of the chat bar and one of the prayer team members will meet you there. You can also join the coffee lounge right now to connect with others. And if you're up for it, share something that the message has prompted you to remember and celebrate. Uh, we need one another and coffee lounge, live prayer, current groups. These are all wonderful opportunities um, to be able to connect with others during the week. That's what we've got for you today, current family. To say that we miss you is an understatement. We love you. Go in peace and we'll see you soon.
Yes, it is.